Why do I have to always straighten you guys out? You're listening to Banal of America Audio. Have a good weekend, knuckleheads. Yeah, it has been interesting. Where do you think um, the 9-11 thing is going to go in the future? Like I said, now, you said, obviously, I do agree with you that it's still wildly popular, but it seems like it's taken a backseat in the mainstream view to, like, the ghost stuff that's all of a sudden even more popular. It seems like 9-11 is a little bit, maybe they're at number two, I guess you could say. Well, the the ghost thing has certainly taken off, and I think that's obviously the result of, of the reality TV uh, phenomena. The, these TV shows that are showing ghost hunting in all of its scientism um, <laughs> um, are, are popularizing uh, the idea of going out and that DIY culture, do-it-yourself uh, mentality of folks, and I think that's really cool and empowering. Again, it's 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 kind of similar. It's like, well, it's with the amazing access to technology that we Westerners have in the form of camcorders, cell phones, electronic uh, 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 recording devices, EMF detectors, all these things that are fairly easy to get access to nowadays. Um, anybody can become an investigator, and with the web, anybody can spread their their uh, investigations for everybody to see. And I, I was really blown away just over a year ago when I started looking on MySpace for paranormal groups. And I was, <laughs> I was like, oh, my God, there are literally hundreds and hundreds of them. And it's kind of like in the, in the UFO heyday when there were you know UFO chapters around the country, but there was, there was no Internet. So, again, they were doing it through snail mail uh, and shortwave radio. Uh, which, of course, is popular amongst uh, a lot of conspiracy researchers as a way of, of communicating and networking. So at the same time that there's been this wild explosion of activists in the 9-11 truth movement, yeah, there's been this uh, a similar explosion in, in uh, researchers into the paranormal, particularly classic ghost hunting type activities. And uh, you had a guy on recently uh, who I was re- I really was glad to hear – him on your show because I forget the fellow's name, but he's he said right up front that you know he he really had a problem with a lot of the research out there because they're proceeding they think they're practicing science but they're really they're going into it with a prescribed idea about the nature of the afterlife and and the po- probability of the existence of ghosts and kind of going from there and I think again that's kind of the basic problem with so much research, whether it's UFOs, 9-11 conspiracy, or, or ghost research, is that people just proceed from their assumptions and their own uh, belief systems, even though they might l- really be trying to practice science or ch- practice good investigative technique, but some of them need to br- brush up on that. Yeah. But um, I guess where I see it going as far as 9-11 is I fear that depending upon the continued slide of civil liberties in this country, we could start seeing the kind of uh, repression and uh, categorization of these kind of political activists as terrorists that we've all started worrying about for the last several years. Yeah. That, you know, with the Homegrown Terrorism Act and all this crap that they're pushing, where, you know, if you express you know, anti-government sentiment, basically, you could, you know, be con- categorized as a, as a terrorist. It's getting pretty scary, and I don't know what kind of tipping point we're looking at. Um, you know, you've got people like Naomi Klein and Naomi Wolf with the, the letter to a young patriot and, and uh, the shock doctrine, you know, really waking up a lot of liberals to the fact that, you know, liberal fascism is as bad as, you know, conservative fascism. It's, it's the same thing and that, that, that we're really on the slide right now and, and that there are, you know, these telling signs of a police state and a tyranny uh, emerging and strengthening and, you know, what's it going to take before either people really do react to bring about some significant change or before the next big crackdown happens. I don't know if we're ever going to get a legitimate investigation of 9-11. I, obviously, that's where most people want to see this thing go, yeah. is they want to see an independent investigation. Um, you know, Ron Paul was asked about, you know, should there be a, an investigation, uh, another investigation in, into 9-11, and, and he made the point, well, if it, there is another one, it'll just be another government investigation, and you know how I feel about those. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like, well, don't ask, you know, the suspects to, to do the investigation. On the other hand, his his crowd, and, and I'm often a part of that crowd, you know, has our, our disdain and, and problems with the idea of globalism in its worst forms. 
And so the idea of having some sort of international, uh, let alone a United Nations-backed uh, investigation is not particularly reassuring. Yeah. So it comes down to, well, how does one handle this sort of thing? And I like the fact that some of the more respected parapolitical groups um, have held mock grand juries to try and prosecute the people that seem to be involved in the 9-11 shenanigans, you know, in a mock trial scenario. And as always, there are people in the parapolitical patriot movement communities who are looking at some of the more radical but absolutely valid um, constitutional remedies for these crimes and misdemeanors. And, 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 you know, that goes to both the tax resistance movement, the tax freedom movement, uh, and the uh, informed jury movement, these people who are like, wait a minute, you know, <laughs> grand juries can do just about anything, you know, and then you're always being disenfranchised by not being told uh, your rights and powers as a gr- member of the grand jury. And, we have remedies and we have access to tools to uh, bring about the change, but at the same time, the system is so broken and so corrupt. Well, you know, trying to trying to bring about uh, a lawful resolution to the lawless, even though they are the law, can be nigh impossible. Yeah. But I don't want to be pessimistic and and say that it's not possible. It. it I talk to people every day, good people on all pol- ends of the political spectrum, who are just like. It's things are so bad, and they don't feel like they can affect any sort of change. And I, so I try, I try to go back to the well. You know, the best thing you can probably do is just find a, a topic, an issue that's near and dear to your heart, and find you know a, a group, whether it's local or otherwise, to, to help you know work on that issue. Um, but typically, working locally is is the best way to start because uh, you know there's corruption at all levels, and if you've got corruption and conspiracy and uh, that kind of thing going graft going on at the local level you've got more pressing issues than some of those national issues but at the same time things are just so big and bad right now i mean whether it's the 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 nafta superhighway aka trans texas corridor aka the you know move towards the north american union these issues that uh, confront us as a as a country as a, as the united states of america um to you know issues of the economy and food production and uh the environment um Gas all, prices, all that stuff. Yeah. Where do you start? <laughs> exactly. I think the guest you're thinking of that I had was uh, Larry Flaxman, probably. He was uh, the science-based ghost hunter, so I think that was probably who you're thinking of. And uh, the last sort of 9-11 question I want to ask you was just what do you think of what's uh, been a really surprising development in my eyes, uh, and that's the, the vast – well, not really vast, but the surprising handful of uh, – of celebrity endorsements to the 9/11 Truth Movement seems like, you know, every every few months there's a new celebrity that sort of hops onto the 9/11 bandwagon um, that you wouldn't expect, you know, like the Charlie Sheens and Rosie O'Donnells and, and other folks that Margaret are, Cho, Margaret <laughs> Cho, yes, let's not forget Margaret Cho. But yeah. <laughs> I actually was I was really shocked when I tuned in to Alex's show and and I'm listening to this Margaret person talk and I'm like, oh, she's some famous person and. She sounds pretty, you know, with it, and okay, you know, she's a celebrity. Uh, I guess that's good. And then I realized that she was the comedian. I was like, oh wow, I didn't even recognize her voice, and uh, and I've never been a fan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it but, seems like a lot of the endorsers are people I don't really big fans of. Uh, yeah. Even, even in the, I remember earlier last year. Uh, they were like talking about Shirley MacLaine or something was <laughs> had the book with Kucinich and the UFO and everything, and I was like, right. why can't we get you know Charlie Sheen, who's you know he's a good actor and all, but he's also like a notorious womanizer and and you know partakes in prostitutes and all that fun stuff, and it's like, geez, we need like you know we need a wholesome Tom Hanks like guy to to jump on board one of these things. Yeah, um, as far as how I feel about it, at, like so many things, I have real mixed feelings. I. I I'm always happy to learn that somebody who uh, has a lot to lose risks their reputation and comes out uh, expressing an opinion, whatever it may be. I mean, you know, I certainly I somewhat empathize with folks who get that knee-jerk response of, well, you know, that person is just a singer. What do I care about their perspective on this particular aspect of politics? Uh, you know, to me – it's like, well, if if you are if you do find yourself in a position to to speak your mind to a larger audience, 
why shouldn't you? Yeah. Even if I disagree with your perspective, you know, sure, I might be quick like everybody to say, ah, oh, who cares what they have to say about that because they're just, you know, an actor or whatever. But, you know, no, I mean, anybody can be educated about these uh, subjects, and that's just it. People can become very quickly experts, not experts, but they can become well-informed about, you know, this, that, or the other esoteric field. And and, and have an, an interest and, and an opinion about it. And But on the other hand, it's it's kind of like any entertainment media taking on, you know, these subjects. It's it's a double-edged sword, um, whether it's, you know, Mel Gibson and conspiracy theory or whether it's, you know, uh, the, the fine movie Bug uh, about, you know, a guy who has a lot of wild conspiracy theories uh, and thinks that, you know, he's got nanites or something or some kind of engineered uh, virus under his skin. You know, there's these movies that are quite compelling and often do contain those kernels of truth that might help wake somebody up to, you know, parapolitical and paranormal realities. But at the same time, it's those same movies that often, you know, the, the vast number of sheeple out there, you know, if, if something's brought up that's, that was mentioned in one of those movies, they can just go, oh, you got that from that, you know, yeah. that fictional movie, and you don't know what you're talking about. And it's like, well, no, they don't know what they're talking about. Yes, it's from that movie, but that particular fact was true, you know. Yeah. Um, the fact that, you know, Mel Gibson in uh, Conspiracy Theory, you know, it's it's all about the CIA's MK Ultra program. And there's a lot of uh, verifiable stuff in, in that movie, but... Uh, as Ken Thomas <laughs> has said before, you know, it's kind of like as a conspiracy researcher you're watching that, it's kind of like, you know, a black person watching, you know, Step and Fetch It. It's like, you know, you, you get that sense of, gosh, you know, this is how people see us as yeah. wackos. Um, yeah. And so it, it's really hard. I mean, one of the, the articles I've been writing le- recently is based on one of my web radio shows, The Blue Rose Report, and which is inspired by Twin Peaks. Uh, the, and that's a very strange milieu. I mean, most people, when they think of Twin Peaks, they go, oh, that's that weird David Lynch TV series that didn't make any sense and it was like a soap opera, but it was about murder. But then there was weird supernatural stuff in it. it to me, it's like I, I'm a huge fan, um, haven't always been, but recently uh, over the last several years became a huge fan of it. And, and to me, it, it's like, wow, this is a great tool for you know pointing out you know uh, all these different aspects of uh, paranormal and parapolitical phenomena. Uh, through the lens of a of a culturally recognizable product, you know, yeah. um, there's plenty in the X Files that's really powerful. I mean, you know, the whole theme of uh, Mulder being the believer and then having his beliefs completely turned around when when suddenly he's educated about the realities behind some of what he's believed in and how it's, you know, it's government this and mind control that. And, you know, there's there's all these different aspects to it that were covert ops and psychological warfare that he was being, you know, manipulated with. There's some important ideas there. But at the same time, yeah, uh, it's the X-Files, for God's sake, you know. How can anybody take that stuff seriously? All right. Do you want to go keep going with that or? No. Okay. <laughs> Nice. Nice. Good answer. All right. Well, tell me about this Elphis network, because uh, that's that's one of the big things I see your name attached to quite a bit, and um, I always kind of wanted a little explanation on what the Elphis network is all about. Ah, well, let's see. Going back to the 90s zine scene, I, like Adam Go Rightly, <laughs> I wanted to uh, trade zines. I wanted to – I had this urge and desire to meet people who were interested in all the same subjects as I was and to – talk about them from an uh, an aspect uh, that was similar to my own perspective. And so my attempt was, okay, you know, I had my friend locally producing Crash Collusion magazine, which had a lot on consciousness, shamanism, uh, ethnobotanicals, a.k.a. psychedelics, uh, and magic and conspiracy and UFOs. I was fascinated from the beginning, again, with these electromagnetics aspects. I mean, I'd grown up hearing – about parapsychological research, you know, one of the first things you come across is as people were trying to do ESP experiments, you know, it's like, well, okay, if, if there's a physical medium for the transmission of this information, it's probably electromagnetic that since, you know, electromagnetics represents a field of influence that we can't see with our uh, senses, but which is there and can transmit information and energy and 
uh, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So it, it's it's the, it's the ether idea. And so very early on in psychic and paranormal research, there were people trying to, you know, transmit uh, information from one mind to the other and to, sh to to test the hypothesis that electromagnetics were involved. They would put the person in a Faraday cage, a an electromagnetically shielded environment, so that they could see if if the signal was still getting through. And what we come up with over and over again is that while electromagnetics uh, do seem to impact, affect, influence paranormal, parapsychological, uh, psychic phenomena, it does not seem to be the carrier for it. And the reason I say all that is because the name Elphis comes from the name of my zine that I started uh, in like 92 or 93. Three, maybe it was 94, I forget, but mid-early 90s, I started a zine called ELF Infested Spaces after Terrence McKenna's phrase, Elf Infested Spaces. For those that aren't familiar with Terrence McKenna, in a nutshell, he was kind of the Timothy Leary of the 90s, uh, proselytizing the benefits and uh, wonderful strangeness that he had uh, uh, encountered uh, under the influence of various psychedelics. Uh, he, he and his brother, Dennis McKenna, uh, went down to the Amazon uh, looking for ayahuasca and uh, instead found the psilocybin mushroom and uh, under the influence of these various psychedelics, uh, they were enlightened, uh, uh, educated, uh, lied to <laughs> by these <laughs> this, these drugs uh, about different scenarios and uh, Terrence being the quixotic, quicksilver trickster that he was and is, even from beyond the grave, he he didn't necessarily subscribe to any one of them. He entertained all these different possibilities, and, and one of the possibilities was that the psilocybin mushroom was an alien intelligence that that uh, communicated to him that it was an alien intelligence that seeded itself through space because spores can survive in the atmosphere or in, in in a vacuum of space, and they can be born up out of the atmosphere and out into space by Brownian motion, and so they can hypothetically travel from planet to planet, and and once they interact with a, a being that has a certain type of consciousness, they can start evolving that consciousness towards ultimately being spacefaring and continuing to move the spore across the universe. It's kind of a wild idea, but that was one of the things that he uh, espoused as a possibility. And he basically uh, also started promoting another drug called DMT, dimethyltryptamine, which mm -hmm. is a fascinating drug that he and others described as a UFO experience on demand. And while it the, the descriptions don't necessarily follow true exactly to the classic alien abduction, there's a lot of overlap of experience there in terms of, again, humanity's historical historic uh, experience with contact from alien others. It's, it's, there's a lot of similarities, and he described that realm as being elf-infested spaces. So I took um, that phrase and his ideas and, and his energy and, and this idea uh, as the name for my magazine, elf-infested spaces, but I, I spelled it E-L-F after extremely low frequency electromagnetic radio energy. Um, E-L-F is one of the largest wavelengths uh, in the EM spectrum that humans have experimented with, and in fact, uh, it's what we've been using to communicate with our subs from land uh, with uh, these mile-long antennas. You know, just imagine, you know, those those telephone and electrical lot wires you see going mile after mile into the distance uh, in certain areas. Yeah. Those can actually act as antenna, and there's been special ones set up over the years by the military to communicate in secret with their submarines who are uh, shielded by that huge amount of salt water. And since so much parapsychological research had been done into the possibility that ELF might be the, the carrier way since it is so big and could go uh, long distances and can't be easily shielded against, they, a lot of people have said that that's probably the communications channel. So I just made it ELF infested spaces. I added the, the moniker um, Journal of Possible Paradigms because uh, Robert Anton Wilson had made me realize that I, I, I shouldn't call it Journal of the New Paradigm because, as he said, yeah, any new paradigm is going to be as bad as the old one. So <laughs> better to be, you know, uh, better to, as, as Greg Bishop and others uh, uh pushed us towards, you know, to, to embrace the excluded middle. Uh, don't do that either and, either or kind of mentality, but a both and interpretation yeah. of things, a pluralistic, multidisciplinary appreciation of all these areas. And so um, it was actually uh, excluded middle, excluded middle writer, founder, Robert Larson, uh, I believe, who suggested to me, he, I think he just started calling me Elphis at some point. Um, as, a, as an acronym for Elf Infested Spaces, ELFIS. And when I was back in uh, 97, I was about to 
purchased my first domain name uh, on the emerging World Wide Web. I wanted it to be for my magazine, Elf Intestine Spaces, so I went with Elphis. And uh, since at the time Elphis.com was taken, I, I went with Elphis.net, and thus was born the Elphis Network. And over the years, having a little bit of uh, web design skills, <laughs> I started helping friends, you know, with websites and just I kind of like like my book collection. I started accumulating these yeah. websites uh, to the point where now I probably I I host or maintain somewhere between forty and fifty websites. Oh wow! Um, most of them are just you know one offs. When I was in a mood of, for a certain name, <laughs> but I host you know a variety of websites for different friends and nonprofits and different projects of mine over the years. For example, uh, just recently uh, helped uh, Greg Bishop launch uh, a site for his his weekly show, uh, Radio Mysterioso. I've got a friend who's uh, in a nearby central Texas town who's an electromagnetics expert himself, and uh, he's got a website called EMF Interface for electromagnetic field interface, and he basically does consulting, and he'll uh, go to people's homes and uh, do a, basically an on-site inspection uh, to, to ascertain the uh, extent of electromagnetic pollution in the home because – I, as much as I use these technologies, I really have been – everything I've read about them over the years, I really need to – everybody needs to minimize their exposure, but that's really hard to do because basically, folks, we're awash in a uh, unhealthy electromagnetic smog that most of us can't perceive, but which we actually are probably being influenced by more than we realize, and that's the result of the EMF given off by uh, electrical power lines, telephone lines, uh, your Wi-Fi in your home, your cell phone, your cordless phone. All that stuff is contributing to uh, just a nasty, nasty environment that had never existed on this planet before. And uh, so my friend Jim Beal at EMF Interface is a great person to contact. And he's an amazing figure. He's been involved in the uh, alternate science community uh, from the beginning. I mean, he's one of the original founders of IONS, the Institute of Noetic Science out in California, founded by former astronaut Edgar Mitchell mm -hmm. that's been involved in a lot of electromagnetics uh, and, and uh, ESP research and whatnot. And so he's he's another person who I, whose side I host. Uh, I love the word anomaly, and so I've I've gobbled up a number of anomaly related domain names. Um, <laughs> I, I host the website for the Austin Mufon chapter. That's AustinMufon.org. Um, I uh, have, of course, websites for my Anomaly Radio Network, which your uh, show is on, and all yep. these other shows are on. That's AnomalyRadio.com. I've got one for videos. That's AnomalyTV.com. There's just so many other people. Uh, my friend Angela Keaton. Her website, site, uh, AngelaKeaton.com, and yeah, just lots and lots of websites. That's the Elphis Network, so you, you can you find go. all kinds of stuff. There's 9-11 sites. There's sites that uh, are kind of like my online dream journal, all kinds of stuff. This is what I was talking about, folks. He's prolific. <laughs> now, let's talk about uh, – you, you sort of just touched on it here, but let's talk about the Anomaly Radio Network, which I am proud to be a part of. Classic BOA episodes running uh, five days a week on the Anomaly Radio Network. I'm really psyched about that. And, of course, your program, the Blue Rose Report, and you host a couple other shows. Uh, talk a little bit about the Anomaly Radio Network and, um, you know, what your goals are and what, what – you know, all about the Blue Rose Report, too. Let's talk about your show in specific. Well, thanks. Um, uh, the – the Anomaly Radio uh, Network is an outgrowth of something I've been doing uh, for the past eight plus years. Um, starting in late 2000, early 2001, I started experimenting with the live web streaming uh, services out there. In the beginning, in the beginning, the network, the net was free. Uh, there were <laughs> there were so many online services that were offering, you know, start your own web radio station for free, and you know, you could either upload your audio tracks to their website and stream off of their site, or you could, if you had a you know a high speed connection, you could stream from your home computer. And so I've basically been streaming live 24/7 uh, from my own home computer since 2000 2001, and I started experimenting with doing live shows, not just playing my music and uh, not my favorite music, but uh, playing any kind of audio I could find. And uh, of course, several friends of mine uh, have been doing their own actual radio programs. Uh, Greg Bishop has experimented in uh, micro FM, aka pirate radio, uh, <laughs> for a long time. And, and uh, Robert Larson's had his own uh, radio show. My friend Angela Keaton had a, uh, she was a station manager at one of the best community radio shows uh, on the planet here in Austin, Co op Radio. Um, and so I had all these friends who were involved in radio, and I was streaming. And basically back in late December 05, I guess, I, I 
I decided that I was going to go ahead and make the leap and try to do a commercial web radio station. Instead of doing it as a hobby, as I had for all those years, not making a, a dime and, and spending too much money, um, I decided to spend even more money and make even less. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and so I, I decided to, to uh, basically get all my friends to contribute to the network, um, and thus was born Anomaly Radio uh, early January 2006, I guess. We've now evolved to having uh, 18 different shows, and every every show is on at least some point during the day. So uh, weekdays, there's a, a set schedule of all these different shows, yours included, and they range the gamut from hardcore anti-war libertarian shows like my friend Scott Horton's Anti-War Radio, where he's always interviewing the most amazing foreign policy analysis analyst uh, types, you know, these different people uh, who are, are either right over there in the thick of it uh, in the war zones or who are part of the policy makers and uh, movers and shakers, and that's a fantastic show. And then, of course, we've got Been All of America, weekdays, yes. 4 to 5 p.m. Central Standard Time. And we've got uh, John Greenwald, uh, you know, used to be the youngest UFO guy on on uh, on the scene, and he's been doing the Black Vault forever, doing his Freedom of Information Act request, and he's got his Black Vault radio show, and uh, just a whole bunch of others. Um, Todd Sheets from the paranormal community, uh, really, you know, to talk about somebody who's you know unifying all those different <laughs> hundreds of UFO groups. Uh, you know, Todd is 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 trying to be a uniter and not a divider, and and is uh, constantly you know having folks on from the paranormal community to uh, and try to bring people together. And then we've got, you know, our irreverent morning show style, you know, really obnoxious guys uh, that do a show called Nervous Teeth. Uh, it's a weekly roundup of the paranormal and parapolitical, but they're hilarious, but they're also going to offend a lot of people out there. So, And uh, just too many shows to mention. But yeah, my, my show on Wednesday nights, which I honestly have not been doing lately, uh, uh, is the Blue Rose Report. Uh, the Blue Rose Report was inspired by uh, the idea expressed in the Twin Peaks movie prequel called Fire Walk With Me, and that is the idea of Blue Rose Cases. Remember, folks, this is – Twin Peaks came out before, like a year and a half before The X-Files, but it was basically kind of an X-Files show, only it's even stranger because it was David Lynch. And in the prequel, Fire Walk With Me, we learned that uh, a certain FBI – Bureau chief, played by David Lynch, uh, has what he calls his Blue Rose cases, and uh, only through a little bit of research might you learn that the Blue Rose is an unattainable species of rose. There, there, there is no naturally occurring Blue Rose, and so it's, the Blue Rose has always symbolized the unattainable, but as, as well as the, the unexplained, the, and, and the myth surrounding the Blue Rose in different cultures manifest in a variety of forms, but they they often involve the, the reality of a paranormal realm and paranormal entities. And um, the Blue Rose Report was my attempt to, uh, as I said earlier, use uh, the Twin Peaks and Fire Walk With Me storyline as a, uh, a launch pad for folks who might have only a passing interest or knowledge about the esoteric and UFOs and and strange phenomena to delve deeper and and not just deeper but into the more the wilder side if you will yeah. of of ufology and parapsychology going after Mac Tony's uh, coining of crypto terrestrial it's it's crypto ufology folks it's the the hidden coded side of ufology um and and that encompasses some of the uh, ideas about the esoteric and occult in the sense of secret societies and and not just secret societies in terms of covert ops but secret societies that practice magic and their own self mind control techniques um, to better themselves, but also in some cases to manipulate the very fabric of reality, perhaps. And there's just so many different touchstones in the Twin Peaks series that can be used as, oh, well, you know, remember that thing in the, in the episode such and such where this happens? Well, that, you know, he may not have intended this, but, you know, in that post modern literary sense, it's like you can really use it as a springboard to talk about these other things, whether they were intended or not. Um, you know, the fact that uh, the owls are not what they seem, uh, that was a, a theme that recurs in the series, the idea that, that the owls that uh, fly amongst the, the mysterious trees that surround Twin Peaks uh, may actually be spirits themselves or, you know, the the eyes and ears of, of, of these entities from the Black Lodge and the White Lodge, these two 
possibly opposing forces that are at play uh, in, and in some ways on a murderous rampage of humanity, in the, at least in the town of Twin Peaks. And uh, so Blue Rose Report has been my, my excuse for uh, delving into the darker, weirder side of, of ufology and parapsychology and the paranormal, while at the same time incorporating the parapolitical. Unfortunately, um, I do two other weekly shows. Unfortunately, I have uh, <laughs> yeah. two, two other shows with some wonderful co-hosts on Tuesday nights and, and Thursday nights, um, and I've been more focused on doing those. And then uh, it's that's been a joy to work with uh, my friends Mac White uh, on the Tuesday night show PSYOP Radio, and that's spelled P-S-I instead of P-S-Y. PSYOP with a Y, of course, a, a pseudo uh, conjunction of uh, psychological operations, psychological warfare. The the idea of uh, manipulating people's minds and beliefs toward military and political agendas, basically the same thing that marketing and advertising does to make you buy things. We've called it PSYOP, uh, PSI, because we have an understanding and an appreciation and an interest in the psychic realm, the ESP realm, the realm of, of the psychic, whether it be in just the terms of the, the psyche, how, how mind control and, and psyops in the classic sense can influence people's psyches, but also the, the element of, of psychic uh, research there. I mean, um, anybody who's looked into remote viewing uh, has to, you know, kind of wonder about, you know, what the, the military and the government might have done with some of the more speculative arenas of, of remote viewing and what's called um, DeMille's direct mental influence of living system and remote influence uh, techniques that are pretty con in, in the worst, darkest uh, modes uh, were reported to be you know, things like the Russians using psychics to try to stop people's hearts <laughs> and things like that. And so Mac White and I do that weekly show, uh, and it's also carried on Revere Radio Network, the, the worldwide home of free speech, no matter how ugly. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we've been doing that for about two years. No, no, about just over a year now. What am I saying? Two years. About a year now. And uh, that's always fun. Mac White is an amazing comic artist and uh, an amazing parapolitical researcher. He's he's actually interviewed in uh, Timothy McVeigh's favorite uh, uh, Waco documentary, <laughs> uh, Day 51, uh, a famous uh, documentary about uh, Waco, which, of course, is the anniversary this week, mm -hmm. this weekend, um, is unfortunately the anniversary of that horrific series of parapolitical events. He's also published a number of fantastic comic books over the years uh, incorporating his uh, interest and in research into the paranormal and the parapolitical. I first came across his work in a local newspaper. He was doing a really amazing series called Stigmata Sunrise, and it was all about millennial you know, Y2K cults and prophecy and incorporated just so many amazing things. And when I finally got to meet him, it was just like wow, you know, somebody who's really, you know, uh, interested in all the same areas as I am, but, you know, who's been around the block a few times and yeah. grew up, you know, he's an, he's an older gentleman than I am. And he's had his own experiences with psychic phenomena, including um, as a child having a premonition about JFK's death and learning from his dad, who's his, uh, Mike White's father was a, uh, a local newspaper man here in, in uh, Texas and uh, was was speaking out then, right after the assassination, uh, the coup with the JFK hit. And so, you know, Mac's no stranger to the controversial and the parapolitical. And on Thursdays, I do uh, a show with my good friend Craig York, who's uh, fascinated by ghost stories and Fortean phenomena and, and paranormal, and he's really into you know cutting edge frontier science news. And uh, he's also a talented voice actor. He's involved in local uh, radio live radio theater. Uh, there's a local oh, nice. uh, theater group called the Violet Crown Radio Theater Players. And for those that don't know, Austin has was called the the city of the Violet Crown after I think a famous guy O Henry. Um, coined that phrase, or I don't know if he coined it, but he made it stick. Um, and so this local theater group, they do they do radio plays, but they do them live in front of an audience. It's kind of strange. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, he's he and I met through uh, my day job with the the Talking Book Program, where we do audio books for the blind and print disabled, and uh, we run a volunteer recording studio. Uh, and it, and I would encourage anybody, no matter what state in the United States you're in, and in a few other international countries, most a lot of uh, forward-thinking governments have these programs 
providing books on tape to the blind and handicapped so that they can have equal access to uh, literature and information uh, that you and I might take for granted because uh, we can see. <laughs> and uh, so he's also got he's a, he's also an avid model builder and has a fascination with uh, um, strange military hardware. Like so, there's all those weird you know you've you've heard all those weird stories about the the Nazis coming out with the craziest weapons, uh, you know some of which they actually built. Um, he's he's fascinated by that um, and uh, he's also we share an interest in you know animation and and science fiction and and then the, there's all the other shows you can go to anomalyradio.com and you can see all the different shows like i said there's 18 different shows some of them are live like we we carry uh, anti war radio live every day as well as Catherine albrecht the uh, woman who uh, wrote the book spy chips and who her main thing is the prison planet control grid that's being instituted slowly but surely uh, to enslave humanity via you know, technologies like the RFID, the radio frequency identifier chip that they want to put into everything and everybody. Um, yeah. She's fighting that tooth and nail. Um, and just a whole just host of shows, other shows. Yeah. A whole host of other great shows. Uh, Adam Go Rightly's Untamed Dimensions, uh, Errol Bruce Knapp's uh, Strange Days Indeed uh, out of Canada. That's a great UFO show. And Oh, and I don't know how many people out there might be fans of uh, Mike Watt, the amazing bassist from the old punk band called The Minutemen. He's a phenomenal musician and, and plays with everybody, and he's got a long-running three-hour radio show that he puts out as a podcast. We re-air that. It's called The Watt from Pedro Show, and it's like he does great interviews with people as he tours the country and the world, and fantastic stuff. Nice, nice. Definitely. Folks should check this stuff out because, you know, we only put out, you know, an hour or two a week, so there's plenty of time for people to listen to other shows, and definitely uh, the Anomaly Radio Network is a showcase for so many great shows. Now, to take the conversation down a completely different avenue, talking about prolific, I see here on your resume that you are a pro-am hand model. <laughs> I'm a professional, pro-am, professional amateur hand model. Uh, well, well, I presume you're master of your own domain. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I decided to, to put that up there as a nice joke. Uh, a lot of people don't think about Bigfoot when they think of Texas, but there's a, a lot of uh, excellent Bigfoot research going on in Texas. And what does this have to do with my hand? Well, you know, <laughs> one of the one of the um, Bigfoot researchers here in Texas is a guy named uh, uh, Chester Moore Jr. And uh, for a while, there were two different awesome Bigfoot conferences every year here in Texas: the Southern Crypto Conference put on by Chester Moore that I mentioned, and uh, Craig Woolheater's Texas Bigfoot Research Center, and now it's Texas Bigfoot. Conservancy, uh, they put on the Texas Bigfoot Conference. Two excellent conferences. Um, well, I was lucky one New Year's Day to make a trip out to East Texas, the Piney Woods of East Texas, the boggy, swampy uh, woodlands there. I mean, we've got more woods in Texas than I think California uh, and Oregon and Washington combined. And it's in those Piney Woods that most of Texas's wild man stories and Bigfoot legends uh, have emerged. And uh, a good friend of mine named Rob Briggs, who's written his own book on uh, the Piney Woods and, and strange stories, uh, both paranormal and cryptozoological associated with the wild man of the big thicket, um, he uh, scheduled a, a, a field trip out into the Piney Woods with uh, my good friend Chester Moore. And we were looking in an area where they felt certain there was a lot of activity and when we were looking for tracks, we photographed what's often referred to as kind of a, a swoop track, or a uh, it's not it, it's not necessarily the size of it. It's it's it doesn't seem to show the differentiation you would imagine in uh, like you know with the different toes. Um, there's a lot of variety of strange tracks that cryptozoologists have been documenting, and we found this one, and my hand was put down as a reference for uh, <laughs> the size. And so thus was born my first uh, uh, published hand modeling photograph. Um, <laughs> uh, recently, a, a good friend of mine who has no interest in the anomalous per, per se, but he's a prolific science fiction writer and horror writer. He's just a writer, but um, he's, he's been involved in the Masters of Horror cable TV series, and uh, he's working on uh, the sequel to Bubba Hotep and uh, some other awesome horror movies. And uh, he's got a new book coming out called The Shock Festival, and it's kind of a it's a it's a faux history of a B movie 
community that ever existed. So it's like it's a coffee table book with the most amazing, outrageous B-movie posters you've ever seen for movies that never existed, but with a storyline that explains the history of all the people involved who never existed. <laughs> nice, nice. Uh, and so uh, he got me and a whole bunch of other folks to do uh, modeling for the posters, and then he would paint over them and and cut and paste and make different posters. And now he's he's actually, besides the book, which is going to come out later this year, he's uh, got, getting a lot of work doing these posters for people, both for movies that are coming out as well as just special projects that people want him to do. And so my hand holding various uh, firearms has ended up on several people's bodies. So, um, Nice. So now I, I, my my hands have, have acted as models. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you didn't think we'd go down this direction in the hand model. Uh, once I saw it on the resume there on the website, though, I was like, oh, that's got to go in the notes, hand model. Yeah, I keep flashing to that, you know, uh, Seinfeld episode. Oh, yeah. It stands uh, you know, finally finding his calling. <laughs> yeah, as long as you're not running around with oven mitts on all the time because you don't yeah. want to damage your hands. Not yet. <laughs> that's good. I guess you could say one of your newest big projects that you have going on is the Anomaly magazine that you have recently launched. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how many issues you put out, but it's it's pretty new, I presume, from what I understand. It's, it's very new. Um, we basically launched it uh, this at the new year. Um, we've put out a, a, a couple of issues um, in a in a broadsheet format. We're intending it to evolve towards a more traditional tabloid or magazine style. Uh, publication. Um, right after 9-11, um, a friend of mine who had helped sell ads and find sponsors for the, the New Fought Conference uh, in 2001, um, he decided to start a publication called the Austin Para Times and, and approached me to be the editor and content wrangler and writer for it. And so I really had a great time doing that, but we went our separate ways and He's now doing a magazine called Weird, um, and it's 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 a great magazine for all things strange and whatnot. But you know, I've, I I still want to to put out material that's both paranormal and parapolitical, and that both entertains, educates, and enlightens. But you know, as always, we're in you know a parapolitical crisis, and so I want there to be a a good uh, amount of that in there too. And a, a variety of things came together uh, late last year. Uh, including uh, my good friend that I mentioned earlier, Mac White, uh, retiring from his day job, and uh, a couple of other uh, people I'd met who were either already involved in publishing, publishing backgrounds, and uh, one of whom who had a keen interest in all things paranormal, ufological, and cryptozoological. And a year previously, we had um, run into each other, and I told him about some of my business project ideas. And a year later, he contacted me saying, hey, man, I quit my day job and I want to do this project, one of these magazine ideas. And so the, these three other conspirators, Mac White, Tom White, and uh, Jeremy Wells, um, have basically uh, kind of, we all, <laughs> it was like a strange attractor. We just kind of all came together and felt like it was time to do something like this. So uh, we started doing that and it's just really barely getting off the ground. We've got the website, anomalymagazine.com, where we've posted uh, most of the content that's appeared in print and stuff that's uh, going to be, be appearing in print. You know, right now it's mostly intended as an Austin publication. It's it's put out um, for free at you know about a hundred locations across uh, the city of Austin, and um, it's it's in the, the form of a broadsheet. It's just one, currently it's just like one sheet folded over with uh, you know like about five meaty articles per issue, several of which are usually uh, a local political type of activism oriented, you know, just reporting on the facts about what's going on locally. But then there's the, the anomalous component, the uh, the paranormal and, and ufological articles that uh, Jeremy and I and, and Mac White are contributing. Um, and the ultimate aim is uh, we're going to be, we're, we're working on uh, shifting it from, uh, we, we still want it to come out in the broadsheet format as often as possible, but we want to put out uh, a more um, tabloid newsprint style uh, magazine style publication, but as always, I, I tend to uh, see so many of these projects as being interrelated, um, and 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 the, I, I have a vision for you know what I want it to be once it grows into its full maturity. And we're looking at doing, you know, starting locally, but we we hope to eventually have it be national and international. 
and and graduate up to you know a newsstand variety magazine uh, maybe one that might we might even do subscriptions uh, as well as of course you know ebook download versions of the of the magazine you know there's great places online like the UFO store dot com where you know they're really pushing this the the, the PDF downloadable versions of magazines now it's really hard uh, to to be successful uh, in the publishing field I mean magazines like Fate and Forty Times are some of the only ones that have actually managed to, to last in yeah. length of time um, even the the MUFON Journal you know uh, you know MUFON used to be the largest civilian UFO research organization in the world and they used to have you know a really good magazine and I I I'm sure it's still good but it's never been a newsstand magazine and it's always been a struggle to keep, you know, that going. And, you know, th- it's, it's really adapt or die. So uh, we're not ruling out any potential delivery options. Um, and so digital downloads is another option. Um, I've mentioned, you know, in my day job, I provide audiobooks for the blind and handicapped. Well, one of my other areas of interest is in the business world of audiobooks. And I've got a lot of contacts locally and elsewhere involved in the audiobook industry. And um, one of the things we're moving towards is, is producing uh, anomaly paranormal, parapolitical UFO audiobooks. Oh, and, nice. Um, there's just not – if you go to, like, the, the websites that, that sell audiobooks, there just are hardly any UFO books in audio format. There's hardly any paranormal books of any note or repute. And you can't tell me that, that you know, your average audiobook reader isn't interested in that. I think that there's a variety of things that have contributed to that. But how that connects to Anomaly Magazine is that we're looking at doing uh, an uh, audio version of the magazine very soon. Nice. So it's like we're going to – we're, we're – Continuing to do the the small print version that's a, more of a like a a weekly, you know, monthly kind of a publication. But we want to do a more a meatier thing where it's not just you know a two sided uh, folded piece of paper and and that's you know got the full on you know multiple juicy articles that people can sit down uh, and and not read through in one sitting kind of thing. And with the audio component, you know, taking advantage of of, of the internet and podcasting and uh, digital downloads, um, I think we're really approaching. A true uh, anomaly audio network, you know that the, the the radio component, you know, fits in, and the ma- the, the audio version of the magazine fits in too. Um, and so I'm really excited about that. In fact, actually, uh, that's one of the things that we've we're uh, going to be doing is uh, in the evening hours on Anomaly Radio, there's going to be an uh, audio book hour, or audio, Anomaly Magazine audio hour. Oh, nice. Um, where we'll be airing some of the uh, the audio versions of the of the articles, uh, and as we start to produce these uh, audiobooks, uh, we'll be doing, of course, promotional excerpts, uh, and even maybe some radio theater. I, I love you know classic radio theater, and like I said, you know one of my co-hosts is involved in that scene locally, and there's a there's a real resurgence of it. So I, I really I see Anomaly Magazine going in a, a couple of different directions. I want it to be kind of a hip modern culture magazine that is about the anomalous, but see, anything can be anomalous. You can have anomalous art. You can have, you know, is, is corruption an anomaly in politics? That's what I want to know. <laughs> um, I don't think so, but it, nonetheless, to most people's mind, it's it's still anomalous. It's, it's you know, surely the government isn't out to kill me. Um, <laughs> um, and, and so I, I see Anomaly magazine evolving towards uh, a slick assortment of, of cultural uh, material, you know, movie reviews, music reviews, art reviews, but of course with a, a hard core of, of UFO uh, articles, cryptozoology articles, 14 anomalous phenomena research, parapsychological research. One of the things that I'm res- I've resurrected from the old Elthus days is a researcher roundtable where we, uh, you know, put a, a specific question to a panel of experts and uh, get these different people's take on on the same question. And um, one, the one that the question that we're uh, posting right now are answers related to the idea of how does the media influence what's reported in terms of UFO uh, narratives. Um, this was the, actually the first question that I posed 10 years ago to uh, the panel back then, and we got a really amazing uh, variety of responses. And uh, my good friend Greg Bishop finally gave his he, – he, he finally turned in his, his response <laughs> almost 10 years later. Um, um, and of course, you know, we had gotten a response from uh, Jim Keith back in the day. Of course, Jim Keith is no longer with us, um, uh, either due to sinister forces or just bum luck. I don't know. Yeah. But, uh, he did an article about you know the the shapeshifter nature of the UFO entities, and and how the media does influence that. And um, 
so I want to encourage, you know, dialogue amongst these different fields because so often different, you know, so many cryptozoology people don't want to talk about UFOs yeah. and when the fact is that there are overlaps of these phenomena, especially in, in terms of there being outbreaks of, of sightings. Um, and, you know, pe- you know, paranormal researchers and ghost researchers, you know, a lot of them don't want to talk about UFOs or Bigfoot because they think it, it – it doesn't do their area of controversial research any good when, you know, again, there are distinct and obvious overlaps. So um, I, I hope Anomaly Magazine can help fun- facilitate some more community building in that regard. And um, we'll just kind of see where it takes us. Um, again, the technology is evolving so quickly. Um, I've got a lot of uh, interest in video production, and so uh, we've got a lot of people who, locally who have access to video technology, and, and we've got we've already been experimenting with doing some, you know, video uh, casting along with the, the audio casting. So there's just no telling where this could all go. Exactly. All right. Well, you kind of already sort of touched on what's next for you, but I have a sinking suspicion that there's even more what's next for you. So, so <laughs> what do you have coming up on the horizon? Anything you want to plug? Uh, anything people should know about that's coming out uh, your way? Mostly, I, I, n- n- no specific announcements. I mean, uh, we, I'll be promoting the, the new issue of Anomaly Magazine as soon as it's ready to come out. Um, it's going to have uh, – the, the print version will have uh, copies of the articles that I've already posted online involving uh, my, my Blue Rose report uh, explication of the UFO scene via shows like Twin Peaks. Uh, other popular culture references. There's an uh, article I wrote called Guided by Voices about all the technologies and techniques to facilitate the induction of voices in your head uh, that are now making their way into the the marketing and advertising arena, but which uh, UFO and conspiracy researchers have been documenting and warning about for decades. We've got an interview with uh, uh, parapolitical researcher Ken Thomas in the in the next issue, a whole bunch of other parapolitical and paranormal-oriented articles on the horizon for Anomaly Magazine. But as far as ul- the ultimate future of, of all the things I'm involved with, um, I really I want to uh, see my different nonprofits that I'm associated with flourish. Um, you know, I've got all these for-profit projects that it would be great to see them flourish and and uh, be able to allow me the freedom to do these things full time and give them uh, the attention and, and energy they deserve. But the the nonprofits equally need to succeed. I mean, I collected thousands of books uh, and and finally decided, you know, <laughs> these need to serve more than just me. So if I can put them into a, a nonprofit lending library, more people can benefit from them. And so that's why I founded the Anomaly Archives and. That's really where I, I hope to see my long-term future uh, be. I, I want to see the, the, the Anomaly Archives, the Scientific Anomaly Institute, and uh, some of the other nonprofits that I'm associated with locally, the Institute for Neuroscience and Consciousness Studies. Um, all these folks have a drive and desire to help understand uh, the nature of consciousness and, and do parapsychological research and, and, and benefit humanity uh, with what we discover, and we've finally gotten to the point where our organizations are starting to get some funding, and we we really want to start, you know, putting that funding into the community, and, you know, there's there's nothing being negotiated just yet, but let me just say that there's a lot of people out there who have some great research ideas or who have already started, but they just need a little help. And uh, INACS, the Institute for Neuroscience and Consciousness Studies that I mentioned, and the Anomaly Archives are definitely interested in doing our own research, but also helping uh, others in the community. And so I know there's a lot of efforts out there to do research into the alien abduction phenomena with instrumented technology. And uh, there's the archival efforts of, of uh, folks, like I mentioned, uh, um, John Greenwald Jr. doing the, the program. He's recently launched a, a fantastic uh, online archive of all the MUFON journals, and he's helping uh, MUFON uh, archive their materials. And there's just so many great organizations out there. And unfortunately, over the last several years, some of these organizations have shut their doors. So it's it's important to me to see those seekers be able to keep seeking. Yeah. And while, you know, there's often a lot of criticism about people in these different fields, you know, oh, they're just out to make a buck. Well, 
Uh, first of all, it's really hard to make a buck in these different fields, whether it's yeah. the parapolitical activist field or whether it's the paranormal investigation field or uh, the UFO and paranormal parapsychological investigation field. It's it, it can be very tough to earn a living, and I just hope that I can help, even when I ever have any success, <laughs> I can uh, help others succeed too. And and I would say that these nonprofits are, are some of the ways. Uh, that I see that we could um, actually give back to the community besides the way I feel I do through my own Elphis Network and uh, Anomaly Network projects. There you go. There you go. Well, Smiles, I can't thank you enough for ever coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Uh, you were kind enough to have me on the Blue Rose Report uh, last September when we launched uh, BOA Audio onto the Anomaly Radio Network, and uh, recently we were in touch, and I knew just based on your wide berth of experience in the field and your long-time research and all the different projects that you're involved with that you'd have something to say on the paranormal, and obviously you did. We sat down here for one hour and it turned into a two-hour uh, jam session, I guess you could say. It's really what it felt like, and I had a great time talking to you. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate also the fact that you're interested in helping other people and, and sort of uh, helping other organizations grow and other people uh, get their projects up and running and stuff like that. You're a helper, and I, uh, you know, we we need more people like that in the paranormal field. A lot of people are only sort of interested in putting their own work over. And uh, sounds like you're helping out so many other people with their stuff that uh, it's really commendable. So you, you deserve high praise for that. And um, like I said, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show. I really appreciate it, and uh, best of luck with all these different projects. Of course, people can find out more at smileslewis.com, anomalyradio.com. Uh, what are the other ones we should throw in here? Uh, Elphisnet is there you go. The, one of the ways to contact, to, to see all the different websites that I host. Um, and, yeah, there's links there. All right, Elphis. Thank, thank you for net. all the kind words, and, and it was a joy. I really enjoyed talking to you as well, and um, I think you're doing a great job, and, and I think you're providing an, an important resource yourself. You're, you're, you're helping people uh, hear the word of a variety of different perspectives, and uh, even if we don't agree with all of them, they've all got something to add to the dialogue. Exactly. Well, thanks for coming on the show, Smiles. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Well, that does it for this week's edition of BOA Audio Season 3. Big, big, super huge thanks to Smiles Lewis for coming on the show and giving us so much time and insight into all of his various investigations of the paranormal. Of course, you can find out more on Smiles Lewis at the website www.smileslewis.com. Check it out. Also, be sure to check out AnomalyRadio.com and Elphis.net, two of the many websites of the Smiles Lewis Empire. And now, on to this week's edition of BOA Audio Listener Feedback. Coming to us all the way from Alaska, it is Gabe, and here's what Gabe has to say. I was going to try and read the interview with Carl Feint, but I couldn't get past the bright white letters on black background. It's pretty hard on the eyes. Signed, Gabe. That's all he has to say. Short and sweet, bit of a critique on the BOA website, but it brings up an interesting point. If folks are having a hard time reading the summaries at BOA, definitely shoot me an email. Maybe it's time we took a look at changing up the style of how we post the summaries on the BOA pages. Something definitely worth considering, perhaps for Season 4, or retroactively going back and reposting these with black text on white background. I don't know. Just something to think about. If it's something you've been bothered by and haven't written to me before, send me an email let me know if it's something that annoys you. Or if you don't mind it at all or you like it, send me an email and let me know that so I know, you know where people stand on all that. Either way, thank you very much for writing in, Gabe. I appreciate it all the way from Alaska. you got to love that. you got to love getting emails from folks in Alaska. If you'd like to be a part of BOA Audio Listener Feedback, there's three ways to do it. Let me run down the list for you. Either A, write to BOA Audio at Hotmail.com, or simply go to BenAllOfAmerica.com, click the contact button. And the third way is the ultra cool BOA forum, the US of E.com, T H E U S O F E.com. Either go to BOA and click the forum button, or just punch in that URL. That'll take you to the US of E.com, the official BOA forum where we discuss all things esoteric and not so esoteric, like TV, sports, and other fun stuff to help take your mind off the paranormal world every now and again. Any of those three methods 
can help you get your correspondence into my hands and eventually be used here at the end of the program for BOA Audio listener feedback. Up next, of course, it is the thanks portion of the show. Big, big, super huge thanks to the fantastic BOA staff, Leslie, Chiron, Arlie, Joe V, Tina Senna, Rochelle Hawks, and Richard Thomas from Wales. The BOA staff putting out tremendous reading material week in and week out, all kinds of stuff. The debate over skepticism versus debunkery via Leslie's Grey Matters this week. The esoteric worlds of Doctor Who via Richard's Room 101. Regan Lee looked at the Avatar organization in her bi-weekly column Trickster's Realm. Last week, Rochelle Hawks's Medusa's Ladder took a look at a really strange story from the 1930s about X-ray slash CAT scan style images. Very esoteric stuff. Chiron was all over the Phoenix hoax that went on a few weeks ago, and Tina Senna was talking about a monster repelling light. So we've got all kinds of great stuff at POA every day, pretty much. Monday through Friday, we're posting new columns or a little satire from me. But there's always something cooking at Ben All of America. And the bulk of that material is provided by the outstanding BOA staff. Without them, we'd just be a measly little radio show. As we say week in and week out here at the end of the program, if you're only listening to Ben All of America Audio and you're not reading the columns at BOA, you're only getting half the story. BenAllOfAmerica.com. Make it a part of your everyday search for esoteric news and opinion. As you'll hear in the preview for next week's show, we've got a massive international episode on tap for you. These calls cost money, my friends, and of course, hosting the show and the bandwidth and all that funky computer stuff costs me money too. All of those expenses are paid for by yours truly, with help from great listeners like you who make donations. How do you help us out? How do you make a donation? That's simple. You go to BenAllOfAmerica.com, click the PayPal button. That'll get you en route to making a donation to BOA. No donation is too small, and all donations go towards keeping Ben All of America and BOA Audio up and running and freely available for all of our great listeners and readers the world over. Next week on the program, it is part one of two in a lengthy conversation with Australian ufologist Bill Chalker. That's right, we're going to return to Down Under for more international esoteric discussion. In this first half installment, we're going to be discussing the history of the UFO phenomenon in Australia, a plethora of key cases from Australian UFO history, and an in-depth look at Bill's forensic investigation into an alleged abduction that spawned his book, Hair of the Alien. It's another international showcase for BOA Audio as we continue our investigation of the global aspect of ufology with Bill Chalker, direct from Sydney, Australia, on BOA Audio. And on that note, I think we're all set here for the week. Thank you so much for listening, folks, and for your support of BOA Audio. Until next week, this is Tim Benall, signing off.